All right, so um, our topic for the morning is hopeful realism, human rights after 2014. And the reason I title it that way, I've long described myself as a hopeful realist. And realism basically assumes the worst. Realism expects nations to act selfishly. It expects groups to act according to their own self-interest. And it, it uh, deplores naivete. Realism says that you, if, if you go into the world uh, bright-eyed and idealistic and hopeful and optimistic, you will be disappointed. You will be disillusioned. Realism says that it's a lot harder to be disillusioned when you have no illusions from which to be dissed. So I've long described myself as a hopeful realist because I am I am a realist. I do believe that groups act according to their self-interest. I do believe nations act according to their self-interest. But I also believe that that is a force that can be used for good. And that makes me hopeful. But after 2014, it's a little bit difficult to be hopeful. 2014 was a pretty tough year for human rights. Just to give you some examples. In Nigeria, Boko Haram attacked cities, kidnapped hundreds of schoolgirls, of young women, started the international campaign, bring back our girls. There were false reports that they were being released. They weren't. Just two weeks ago, Boko Haram attacked a city of two million people. In Egypt, tens of thousands of people were arrested. News reporters are in jail for violating uh, what we would think of as appropriate, or, or rather for exercising what we'd think of as appropriate freedom of the press. Uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood have been systematically silenced and, and arrested. In Syria, there are over four million refugees have left Syria. Seven and, a half seven and a half million people have been internally displaced. Almost 200,000 people killed in the continuing conflict there. In Iraq, ISIS has killed thousands of civilians. It's been accused by the UN of crimes against humanity. In Ukraine, Russian-backed rebel forces shot down a Malaysian jetliner, killing almost 300 people. In Hong Kong, pro-democracy protests brought over 100,000 people out into the street, but eventually it was cleared by the police with force. In Darfur, the forgotten genocide. It's continued. People are still seeing their homes, their villages burned. 300,000 have been killed, 2 million people displaced. Yet the International Criminal Court announced at the end of, 20, of 2014, the special prosecutor for Darfur said that they were no longer going to be investigating war crimes there because the UN Security Council had uh, shown uh, just a continual disinterest in truly prosecuting the crimes. In Gaza, over 2,000 people were killed and 11,000 wounded in a siege by the Israeli Defense Force. In the U.S., in Ferguson, <clears throat> the militarization of police compounded with a campaign of, of resentment from those who feel continually singled out and, and uh, singled out and challenged uh, unnecessarily, inappropriately by police, uh, has led to 
our country being warned for violation of human rights by places like Egypt. The Israeli, the, the um, Egyptian international minister, uh, minister of foreign affairs, said that the United States needed to work harder on its human rights violations when they saw pictures like this. We surely need to work harder on it when we see the Senate report on torture, which concludes that the U.S. did, in fact, torture people all over the world in, in places where it could be hidden, in places where others could be seen as the actual perpetrators, and even hiding some of that reality from our own administration. Unfortunately, it prompted a nationwide debate about whether we should torture not recognizing that it's a violation of international law, not recognizing that it's a violation of human rights, not recognizing that a testimony uh, solicited through torture is not admissible in court. So when you look at all these things, 2014 was a pretty miserable year for human rights. And when we think about what human rights are, their rights held by individuals simply because they're part of the human species. Their rights shared equally by everyone, regardless of sex, race, nationality, and economic background. What that means is that human rights have no borders. I'm here in Door County, I live in Brown County. My human rights didn't change when I crossed that border. My human rights don't change if I cross the border into Canada. My human rights don't change when I was last summer in South Africa or London or Israel. My human rights don't change by crossing a national border. Human rights don't change with different color skin. They don't change with different religion. They don't change with gender. Human rights are borderless, genderless, sexless, colorless. They're universal. They're held by all people, possessed by all people, simply by virtue of the fact that we're human. But if you look at a map, you'll see that there do seem to be some borders. There do seem to be some differences in the way we experience life, some differences in terms of equality. This is not a perfectly cloudless day and, uh, or night on Earth. This is a composite of satellite photos that shows who has lights, who has electricity, and who does not. And you recognize that with electricity often comes um, the ability to cook without endangering yourself or the ability to have a, a thriving economy. You see it too when you look at poverty. On the blue scale, the, the, the blue colors show those who have an income, an average income of $12,000 or more per year. It doesn't seem like much. Okay? In our country, we would think of that as, as being on, on the poor side. But you look down here, low income level, 995 or less per year, and you look again at whole swaths of our world that are living at that level. Or you look at it this way, in terms of, of those who are experiencing um, a, a radical poverty or, or, or extreme poverty. In our country, less than 2% are in extreme poverty, extreme poverty being less than a dollar a day. But again, you look at Central Africa, you look at South Asia, between 60, 80% of people living in extreme poverty. And what I'm suggesting is that these two are human rights issues. That when we talk about human rights, it's not just an issue of whether we have opportunity to vote it's not just an issue of whether we have free speech. It's also an issue of whether we have food, of whether we have water, of whether we have the ability to flourish as individuals and as families. If you look at a map uh, rearranged in which the size changes by income, 
you recognize that some parts of the world pretty much disappear and others look a little bloated. That's why when you think about human rights, someone like Desmond Tutu says, I'm not interested in picking up crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself my master. I want the full menu of rights. Once the, not just the political rights, not just the civil rights, but also the social, cultural, and economic rights. But the reality is that different countries will privilege different ones. We, we favor different conceptions of rights, and especially we favor those that, uh, that are, are mostly to our advantage. And because when we look at these kinds of maps, they reflect patterns of advantage and they reflect patterns of, of international politics. We need to be aware of how our continuing activity can make the world better or worse. I took this picture uh, in South Africa at a, at a, uh, a community center, kind of like this one, a little, little smaller, a little uh, less developed in a place called Guguletu. And in that community center, this was a poster on the wall. It says, he who upsets a thing should know how to rearrange it. We've upset stuff in the world. Not just the US, not just the West, uh, people everywhere. We've upset stuff. We've violated human rights. We've caused problems. We've perpetuated inequalities. We've abused people. We've tortured people. We've done some bad stuff. He who upsets the thing should know how to rearrange it. So how do we rearrange it? What do we do? Well, at least one thing that we do is we seek to fulfill what are called the, the Millennium Development Goals from the United Nations. See, again, when we think about human rights, we need to remember that they include more than just the ability to vote or the ability to speak. They do also include the ability to eat and the ability to drink. And so when you look at the Millennium Development Goals, here the United Nations said, how can we better the economic and social conditions of people in places where they've not had clean water, where they've not had education, where they've not had health care? And seeing that all those things are included in definitions and expositions of human rights, that all of them are included in the Universal Declaration from 1948, the Millennium Development Goals basically say, how can we do better on those things? We who have upset a thing, how can we rearrange it? And so here's a report on some of the Millennium Development Goals that were to be exercised by 2015. One of the goals was uh, to make poverty history. And since 1990, extreme poverty rates internationally, worldwide, have been cut in half since 1990. Now there's still one in eight that remain hungry. So we need, like these young people down here in the front from Shepherd of the Bay Lutheran Church who are participating in a 30 hour fast to benefit world vision, to, to address issues of world hunger they're making themselves hungry. They're passing on the scones more for us, but they're, they're making themselves hungry in order to empathize with those who are hungry. And it's stuff like that that has contributed to this, this encouraging reality that extreme poverty has been cut in half since 1990. When you think about primary education, enrollment in primary education in the developing world has reached 90%. That's not high school, and often the schools don't have power, often the schools don't have very, uh, very good teachers, but kids are in school over 90% of the time. Now, there's still 57 million not in school, so we still have a ways to go. But it's getting better. Okay? There's, there's a move toward progress. Likewise, when you think about childhood mortality, 17,000 fewer children die every day than did in 1990. And that's with population growth. Okay, so there are more 
kids, but fewer are dying. Now, there are still six million who will die before their fifth birthday. So we still need progress on childhood mortality. But again, we're seeing it move in the right direction, as we are with maternal mortality. Since 1990, maternal mortality has fallen by almost 50%. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's amazing. There's a, there's a, a guy, maybe some of you know him, uh, Father Jack McCarthy. Jack is a Norbertine. He's been connected to St. Norbert College for some time. Uh, he, in fact, now is on our board. But Jack, for the last 30 years, has been a missionary priest in Peru. And he heads a hospital that, that is connected to, uh, it's, it's next to a river that is connected to tributaries that serve a huge area of jungle that is inaccessible except by boat. They are, I think he said, as the crow flies, I mean, just, do they have crows down there? But as the bird flies straight shot to the nearest road, to the nearest paved road, is something like uh, 400 kilometers. Okay. And, and so they, they go everywhere by boat. And every quarter, four times a year, they go out on the boat and they, they check on people. They give vaccinations. They... they they check on serious health problems out there in the jungle, and, and they, in particular, check on the pregnant women. And if it appears as though a woman is having a problem pregnancy, they put her in the boat and they bring her back to their field hospital. Now, it's not a fabulous hospital. It's more like what we would think of here as a clinic, but they do some fabulous things. And in the 30 years that he's been there bringing that kind of care, that kind of service, they've never lost. A mother. Wow. Wow. In 30 years, they've never lost one. That's amazing stuff. And stuff like that's happening all over, in part through maternal education, through prenatal education. But still, only half of the women in developing countries receive the health care that they need during pregnancy. So there's still room to improve, but it's improving. Another one you think about. Uh, about medicines for HIV. In 2012, almost 10 million people were receiving antiretroviral medicine, the, the resurrection drug that is enabling people to live with HIV. Over a million malaria deaths were prevented in the span of 10 years because, again, they're, they're finding ways to treat it. Now, there are still 7 million lacking access to antiretrovirals. And you still see these, these horrible situations in which it's so close, but not quite there. I was in Zambia three years ago, and, and we visited this guy who was dying of AIDS. He was curled up in fetal position on a mat, and, and you knew he does not have long to, to live. This guy also, he had, he had tuberculosis, he had AIDS, and, and the medicine was about 40 minutes away. He needed to get a shot every day. And the only way he could get there is if it would be if his wife or somebody else took him over rocky terrain in a wheelbarrow. Took him out, took him back. They didn't have anybody who could bring the medicine from the clinic to where he was. And I said, couldn't somebody, couldn't like an, a, an aide or somebody just bring it? And they said, well, it has to be administered by trained professionals. And the reality is there are like 30 people in the village in the same situation. So some, they really need two people, two staff people, every day going around the village doing that. And I'm thinking, okay, so these 30 people are going to die because we don't have those two staff people. So I look at people who maybe could be those staff people someday, you know. That's why it's getting better, but it's also why we're not there yet. Because there are a lot of people out there doing amazing things and bringing health care where it needs to be. But we're still short of where we need to be. This one's amazing. 
since 1990, 2.1 billion people have gained access to clean water. That's amazing. I mean, that's really amazing. Now, there are still over 2 billion that don't have basic sanitation. That's still an issue. But it's, again, it's a lot better than what it was. And it's getting better. Here's another example. I don't know if you guys in the front rows recognize the gentleman on the left, but uh, that's former President Jimmy Carter. In 1986, see if I get this number correct. In 1986, three and a half million people were afflicted with guinea worm disease. It, it's this horrific disease that you contract through uh, uh, through, through contaminated water, and, and this larvae takes up residence inside you and grows and then burrows its way out. Okay? It, it punctures your flesh and comes out, and it takes a while to come out, and it's awful. And three and a half million people had that in 1986. Today, thanks to the work of the Carter Center, primarily. It's less than 200 people worldwide have guinea worm disease. And it's going to be completely eradicated sometime this spring. Okay, that's pretty cool. It really is. That's pretty cool. And that's somebody acting on behalf of human rights. Again, these are rights issues. It's not just about people in the street. It's also about people in the bush. It's about people needing water and people needing health care. Now, when we think about these kinds of issues, I would suggest this is, these are human rights issues also in America. Education, health care, economy, jobs. These are, these are rights issues, too. It's not just a matter of freedom. It's also a matter of ability to flourish. And so we see how flourishing is, is challenged in 2015. But we also see that it's on us to help it recover. It's on us to come alongside other people, to show empathy, to show that, that we care about their rights, that we care about their lives, we care about them. So I'm a hopeful realist in 2015, in spite of what's been going on in 2014. One of the reasons I'm a hopeful realist in 2015 is because of stuff that was going on in 2014. Some of the stuff was good. A lot of it was bad. But a lot of it was good. Another reason I'm a hopeful realist Anybody recognize the scene? You might remember the, the movie or the stage play, Les Miserables. A couple, a couple years ago, it was big in the holidays, and now it seems to be dominating cable. If you're channel surfing, you'll have opportunity to see it. But uh, this scene, contrary to, to the way many, uh, many, initially viewed it, this is not the French Revolution. Yeah, this was an uprising in 1832 in which there were insurgents that took to the barricades and, and were advocating for the poor at a time of real economic trouble in Paris. And if you saw the film or you know the stage play, that at, this, at this point, this climax of the movie, they were singing. Do you hear the people sing? Singing the songs of angry men. It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, there's a life about to start when tomorrow comes. But if you saw that, you might also remember 
that that insurgency, that insurrection was crushed, that the barricades were burned, that the people were killed. It was very short-lived. It was very short-lived, as was the, the brief insurrection in 1830, and the one in 1838, and the one in 1848. The one, in fact, the one in 1848, there was a, a contagion of revolution across Europe. It was all shut down. None of it was successful. It was all crushed. But what I want you to see is the way the ideal lived, that they remembered. They remembered the Republican ideals of the revolution. They remembered the ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity. They remembered the hope of, of freedom and participation. That's why in uh, 2012, Bassem Youssef, a, a Egyptian comedian who has a show very much like that or had a show very much like that of John Stewart, had the Arabic version of Les Mis. He said it was 20, 2013, I, said, I spoke. So this is his show, kind of like The Daily Show. And they're singing the same song, but in Arabic. Keep going, see if it'll come back. At this point, the, the host of the show came out and he, he pauses to thank a few people. You'll see him. Uh, if you're a fan of Jon Stewart's Daily Show, you might have seen Asim Yosef one time or another because he was a frequent guest during the time of the Arab Spring. And this show of his was frequently censored by the Islamist government. It was censored under the Mubarak regime, and then it was censored under Morsi. Um, and so this, this moment now, this moment is right near the end of the reign of Mohammed Morsi in, in Egypt. It's right near the end of his presidency. So at this moment in 2013, there were thousands of people in the streets of Cairo protesting the government that was being led by the Muslim Brotherhood, by the Islamist Morsi. And so Bassem Yosef brought out the cast of Les Mis, and they sang, Can You Hear the People Sing? Because he wanted to remember 
what it was to have that ideal, that Republican ideal of freedom at a time of increasing repression. And so at this moment, he tells his audience that they have the words to the song under their seats. So back to our image here um, from 1832. After that scene in the, the, the studio, in the TV studio, there were 14 million people in the streets of Cairo protesting the, the I, I say, reign of Mohammed Morsi and the, and the Muslim Brotherhood. 14 million people asking for change in the government. And it came. Change came. The military took over. And, and at, at first, there was huge hope that people were again going to be free, that Bassem Yosef would again be able to make his silly jokes and nobody would care. They were hopeful that change was coming. They were hopeful that the flag waving would, would result in good things. And again, can you hear the people sing, singing the songs of angry men, the music of a people who will not be slaves again. But that wasn't the result in 1832, and it wasn't the result either in Cairo. The military government that took over not only banned the Muslim Brotherhood, but they started arresting people by the thousand. Just last week, there was a protest in which a lot of people came out kind of peacefully, said pretty much peacefully, to remember the initial street demonstrations that brought on the Arab Spring in Cairo. One of them was this lady here, mother, out holding a sign, she was shot. She died a few minutes later after this picture was taken. About a dozen protesters died there last weekend. Their dreams were trampled just like those of the young men and women on the barricades in Les Mis and in 1832. But this is what I'm trying to say. They still remember the songs of freedom. They still remember those ideals for which they campaign. They still believe in them. Yeah, there are going to be a lot of people who don't get to see what they, what they fight for. But there are also people who don't forget easily. So why am I a hopeful realist in 2015? I'm a hopeful realist because sometimes people take the streets again. After the terrorist murders that took place in the offices of Charlie Hebdo, 
about five million people took the streets in various cities across France to remember the Republican ideals that had defined them. And they said, this is still who we are. We still believe in this. And when they said, I am Charlie, that's what they meant. They didn't mean that they were themselves cartoonists or satirists. They didn't mean that they were that brave. They didn't mean that they were that funny or that sarcastic or that irreverent. What they meant was they believe in freedom. They believe in free speech. They believe in the ideals represented by people who can make cartoons and not get shot for it. And so, again, they're not going to let a dream die. And I think that's true across North Africa. I think that's true in the Middle East. I think it's true in the U.S. And, and so, yes, 2014 was a, a sucky year for human rights in many ways. It was a better year in many ways, especially when you think about things like, like health care, clean water. But in terms of free expression, in terms of free exercise of religion in places, or rights of women, pretty bad year. But there is reason to be hopeful. And I think that's one of them. Now, I, uh, I also have to say, I, I, find, I find hope in your hopefulness. Uh, every year I teach students at the college who want to do some great things. I find hope in their hopefulness. Uh, I've got one who is now working for the uh, National Institute of Health. Um, she, she used to be with the Peace Corps and got a master's degree in public health. Her life goal is to eliminate measles. Okay, that's cool. I like that. I find hope in that hopefulness. Um, this last month, I had a conversation with a student who wanted to go into the Peace Corps, and she told me, she said, I, I, I have a problem, though. I don't really know what you do after. I said, oh, there's all kinds of stuff you can do after. You can go into education. You can, you can go into some kind of community service. You can, you can do almost anything. It, it's great on your resume. It's a great experience. It's, it's, you can do all kinds of things after Peace Corps. And she said, okay, thanks, but that's not what I mean. She said, what I mean is they say you have to stop after two years, and I just want to keep doing it. I find hope in that. I find hope that there are people like her that want to go out and do that kind of thing. And so, again, why am I a hopeful realist? I, I'm not naive about the bad stuff that's happened this year. But I'm hopeful for the good stuff that's happened this year and hopeful for the things that I see coming. So uh, with that, let me pause for a break and let you refresh your coffee, except you guys, I guess it's just like water, sorry. Um, but uh, everybody else can, can uh, refresh here for a minute, and then we're going to come back, and I, and I want to have your, your questions and comments, and we'll talk a little bit. So um, just open now, right? Oh, you see a microphone? Okay. Or if they just yell or throw stuff. Okay. Okay, so, so the image behind us, I just thought I'd change it up a little bit. This is Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, holding the uh, original printed copy of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 1948. It was the second thing done by the UN. The first thing done by the UN was to pass the Anti-Genocide Convention. The next day they did this, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, they thought, and, and in the Truman administration, they needed to find a place to park Eleanor. They thought we need to, you know, she's an influential force. She is a force of nature, but 
you know, we don't really need her messing with important stuff, so let's put her on this little committee. Let her, let her, her voice drown out in a committee. She ended up being the chair of the committee to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it became a much bigger deal than anybody in the Truman administration anticipated. Uh, it, um, it sets forth the ideals of human rights in a remarkable way, given how short a time they had in, in preparing it. And it has stood the test of time in ways that continue to be reinforced through subsequent UN um, conventions and agreements. So we can talk about any of that. Qu questions on anything I've said or anything you hope I wish I had said? Yes. Yeah, I'm wondering if you have any comments on this being the 30th anniversary of that sensational fundraising effort, you know, uh, by the uh, artists, musical artists of the world. We are the, we are the world. <clears throat> well, um, musicians have had a way of highlighting things in in wonderful but short-lived ways, a and so. Um, they catch a lot of attention, and, and they raise visibility, and it's fantastic, and it feels good. And then critics usually start piling on, saying, yeah, but what did you really do? And, and with that, often critics will say, if all of you wealthy musicians had just given all your wealth to this, then it would have really made a difference, rather than just you doing a song or two and having that be something that you thought would change the world. Uh, the fact is, the world gets changed through cumulative small things. And some of them make a bigger splash than others. Uh, some of them working behind the scenes, nobody hears about but are fabulous. Some of the things everybody hears about don't have a net fabulous result. I'm for all of it. I, I, I don't want to be the critic who says that any action has to be perfect. I'm a realist, and as a realist, I recognize that none of our interventions will be pristine. In fact, they're all going to be messed up. They're all going to be tainted by self-interest, and they're all going to have limited effect. And some of the wonderful things we do or the wonderful organizations that we work with will die out. That's OK. They run their course. They're replaced by other things. The momentum continues. I believe in the progress of history. So world vision. World vision's great. I've got friends who are on their staff. Uh, they've been around a long time. 30-hour fast is cool, OK? I was joking with you guys beforehand, though, saying, so did you like have a big meal before midnight? Because I recognize that it's symbolic. What you're doing is symbolic. And the, the $6,700 you raised last year and hopefully the 7,000 or more that you raise this year will, will make a significant difference in the lives of some people, but there are a lot of people that need help. And, and you look at that, and, and somebody might say to you, yeah, but what are you really doing? But well, one thing you're doing is you're inspiring hope in the rest of us. That matters. Another, you're educating yourselves. That matters. Another, you're helping people on the ground, even a little bit. That matters, too. I used to send people on short-term quote, mission trips. And, and we would do these educational service trips in, in parts of Central and East Africa. And, and some people would look at it and they would say, you know, really, why, why spend so much money to go over there when, in, in fact, you could send the money and, and they would know better how to spend it? And I get that. I really get that. But we try to do multiple things with trips like that. We try to make sure we do good on the ground. And it is deeply encouraging for partners over there to plan something with American coordinators and have it turn out and have people come and have it be great. And they would be totally in on the planning. It wasn't just us showing up and saying, we're going to do this or that for you like some colonial paternalist. You know, we would say, 
let's work, let's plan something together. So, so it was encouraging for them when people would show up. And when we wouldn't show up, they would feel forgotten. And so, so it, we would do good on the ground. That was one thing we would do. Second, we would want people to be changed through the process of involvement. So anybody that went, I would expect them to see the deep poverty, to connect with the people, and to be personally transformed. And then third, we would expect them to bring that transformation back to their own communities. And I do the same thing with, with students at the college. So Kurt's son, Logan, was with me in South Africa last summer. And, and there were some people on that trip that wanted to say, we need to do stuff. We need to, like, pick up trash. I'm like, we don't need to pick up trash, OK? That's, that would be like walk, someone walking into your house and saying, can I neaten things up a little bit? You know, we, we didn't need to do that. Okay, what we needed to do was show up and learn their music and sing their songs with them and, and immerse ourselves in, in their cause. And so I, I wanted the students to, to show and signal support by learning their music, but then also to be transformed and to bring that change back to our college. I think they've done that, and I'm proud of them for what they've done. I'm really proud of your, of your boy, what he's done. Um, but all that to say, back to your question, no, it wasn't transformative for the world, but it was something. And, and in that sense, it's a good thing, and I'm glad for it. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks for coming. Uh, I just wanted to relate an experience that Julie and I went through, uh, Julie's my wife over here, uh, in a movement called Beyond War. And uh, that was an effort to connect people that were not part of the political system, but mothers and fathers around the world, people concerned about the overkill of uh, nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles. Yeah. And that was just before the treaties were signed, and it caused the treaties to be reckoned with. And uh, so that's a good experience. Absolutely. Uh, and that's another one. When you look at nuclear disarmament, that's another one that's moving in the right direction. Yeah, and, and the hope out of that was, if, when I remember that, that was back in the 80s, it was people talking to people, but then that causes me to uh, pose this situation. Uh, the, the reason that was, one of the reasons that was so successful is that it began to use the technical sophistication of intercontinental worldwide communication systems. Yeah. We even were part of a, a group that met and simultaneously had a broadcast around the world. That was mothers and fathers, et cetera, and young people and mm -hmm. old people concerned about their grandchildren, talking to each other, not through their political systems. Yep. Uh, which says to me, April, April spring, I believe, was caused by a, essentially a, a young man who had a cell phone. Or Are you talking about Arab Spring? Arab Spring, yeah, mm. Arab spring, I'm sorry. And so is, is that a sign of hope that we don't need to go to other countries, we can stay in touch with real people? And that wasn't around during 1848. Uh, yeah. So it's a, a new world with a new connectivity, which maybe gives some hope that these issues can be connected between people without spending the money to travel yeah. across the world. Is well, there, there's certainly that possibility. Um, and, and one of the controversies right now, one of the debated questions in the area of human rights is whether globalization is friend or foe. Because the same forces of globalization that produce those communications also maintain a lot of people in labor slavery in Central Africa. Our cell phones have minerals in them that come out of mines that are uh, that are held by um, uh, companies or governments who, who essentially employ slave labor and are violating rights like crazy in doing so. And so uh, part of the global reality, I mean, the reality of globalism is that every one of our cell phones has some of that in it, okay? Uh, my iPhone has components that are made in 15 different countries. It's not just one place. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to get an, buy an American made. It, it, it doesn't work that way. And, and so because of that, because of that reality of the global economy, 
of it, it perpetuates systems of inequality and injustice that are not easily addressed. The other potential problem with technology is that it can also be used, uh, or it, it, can be, it can be turned on and off. You know, uh, we saw a little bit around this, uh, the film, The Interview, where North Korea hacked Sony, and then in, in retribution, the US, perhaps through China, turned off the internet in North Korea for a couple of days. Just like, you know, we have the power to turn it off. The other issue with information technology is that it sometimes creates an illusion of, or of connectivity or understanding that is at the same time being monitored. So we saw through WikiLeaks and elsewhere that the activity of the NSA in monitoring communications meant that some of the, what we thought was, was free communication wasn't so free. Um, <clears throat> where, where human rights have flourished worldwide uh, over the last several centuries, where the human rights discourse opened up was in the public space that occurs between our private world at home and the government world, the, the, the government space. In, in between is this buffer, like what we have here, of public space, of pu the public sphere. And in the public sphere, uh, this is where rights conversations flourish. They flourish uh, when people are talking among one another at work, where people are meeting together in coffee shops, uh, where people are able to meet in the street and have conversation. That's where rights conversations have flourished. And, and when that public space is compressed, when you don't have freedom of assembly, when you don't have freedom of the press, when you don't have the ability to speak to other individuals without fear that the government is looking over your shoulder or that the person next to you is a spy, when, when that public sphere gets compressed, human rights uh, are eliminated as the government intrudes into the private sphere. Again, think of it like a buffer that inflates and, and deflates, kind of like Bill Belichick's footballs. Um, so, inflates, deflates. And, and, and as, as, as that happens, uh, you think of things like the arts. You know, I, I enjoy looking at all the posters out here uh, or even the, we are the world. You know, you think about the arts as a way of inflating public space, and that's typically how it has also happened. So that um, with the Arab Spring, it wasn't just that some people were able to communicate on Facebook or communicate with text messaging. They did do that for sure, but they also hit the streets and they talked with one another. And they, they did graffiti that, that communicated. And so uh, last year, I spent a little time with an, an Egyptian graffiti artist who said that that was a significant part of the Arab Spring as he experienced it in Cairo, was communicating with other people through the art in the, those public spaces. You think about the Velvet Revolution in Prague. Uh, if you've ever been to Prague, there's a place called the John Lennon Peace Wall. And it's a place where graffiti artists were started posting uh, after John Lennon's murder uh, some of the lyrics to his song, Imagine. And then they started doing art connected to that. And at the time, Prague, under communist leadership, was a city of grays. It was a city of off-white and black. It was a city of, of repression and not much arts. But the revolution was led by a playwright and it was, it was maintained by artists who every night after the city would whitewash the wall, would redecorate it within 24 hours. And, and they would continue to, to bring back color and music. Think about um, in, in uh, Istanbul a year and a half ago when there were people uh, campaigning for public space in, in, in this, this park, they wanted to meet and. Erdogan was trying to, to limit that assembly. 
and, and the people were making music on pots and pans in the night. And they were communicating in the night. And one of, the, one of those people said, at that time, we need more than our cell phones. We need to see faces. So all that to say, yes, I think it's true. There's potential for fabulous things through global communications. There's also potential for that to be an illusion and for it not to, for it not to replace the, the importance of face-to-face -face public gathering. What else? Yes. You talked about, you know, being able to do small things. And I guess, going back to Wayne's example of Beyond War, one of the small things that we did was to gather people in our own home, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And I think about what we do here in Northern Door County and how we take it the one, ne one next step. And so I guess I want you to talk a bit about that. If we have a concept or an idea or a concern, we start to gather small groups within our own community. How do we take it the next step? What do you do next? Yeah. Um, well, it, um, it might kind of depend on, on what the issue is. Uh, there are some things that are local and involve making phone calls and gathering people and doing some informing and some advocacy locally. Some things go national. Uh, just a quick parenthetical aside about national advocacy. One of my interns uh, spent the summer interning also for a U.S. senator uh, Senator Kirk out of Illinois. And, and uh, Connor's job when interning for him was, was responding to letters, uh, logging the, the letters when people write in, and logging phone calls and things like that. Very interesting stuff he, he, he learned out of that. One is petitions mean nothing. It meant nothing. Petitions went in a box. They, they paid no attention to the petitions. Uh, the letters have to, because they're concerned that you're going to send some kind of poison along with the letter, uh, they go through screening that sometimes takes like a month. So often letters were arriving after the date. And, and when the letters did arrive, they would scan it real quick, make sure it was somebody from their, one of their zip codes, and then they would just check off which side of the issue they were on. And that was all. And they would maybe write a courtesy, send a courtesy form letter back. But a, a form letter, a postcard, a two sentence letter, or a three page handwritten, beautifully edited essay all got the same result. Check, for or against. The fascinating thing too was that phone calls, he said, Phone calls got through right away, and they also got checked for or against. And so he said, far and away, if you're wanting to communicate with a senator or, or a congressperson, pick up the phone, make a quick call, it takes 15 seconds. Hey, this bill coming up, I'm for it. Thanks. Okay, bye. That's it. And that has every bit as much good effect as writing the long letter. That was a lesson for me. I think that's changed, but it's part of our new reality. So you can do that. Okay? You can gather friends to do that. You can, you can gather friends to write letters together, to make phone calls together. You can, you can watch movies and discuss. You can inflate that public space of, pub, of conversation and then talk about what you can do next. Um, we're starting a, a we're, we're hoping to start a, a partnership with a group called Public Achievement that needs coach, uses coaches working with young people to help the young people come up with projects that make sense, uh, that, can, that, that do something, that make some connection. Um, and just as a bit of a pilot in that direction, uh, about two months ago, some of my interns and I went to a middle school and we're helping with one of the middle school teachers in her class project. And, and the students were all broken into groups. They'd self-selected various social justice issues from around the world. And they were trying to propose projects that would connect with those issues and something that they could do in two weeks' time. Okay. Pretty, pretty difficult task. 
they had, they had to get educated about it and do something about it and be done in two weeks because that's the end of the semester. So uh, we were there to meet with some of these some of these kids, and this is again this might be a way to volunteer in the local schools. Um, but uh, we were there to meet with these, with these kids and to coach them on their projects. And so one of the projects was a, a group of middle school, mostly guys and middle school boys. You know, some can be this tall and some can be this tall. And it just, you know, their voices are cracking. They're just wild. And, and so I, I met with these guys and their project, they had seen the movie Captain Phillips and they wanted to do something around Somali pirates. Okay, well, what do you want to do? Well, they wanted to go down to the elementary school and do something with the little kids that would let the little kids earn candy as a reward, and then they were gonna steal their candy and ask them how that felt. And I said, so you wanna be pirates in order to talk about piracy? And they're like, yeah, like, okay, let's rethink that. And, and so I, I said, so why do you think people, why do you think there are pirates? What's going on? What's going on in Somalia right now? And they're like, I don't really know. So what's going on? Why, why do you have so many Somalis in your neighborhoods? Why are there a couple hundred Somali families relocated to Green Bay in the last year and a half? Why? Why is there a huge Somali community in Minneapolis? And they didn't know. And so we ended up crafting a service project. I connected them with a Somali family uh, a good friend of mine, and, and they were going to do a project of have, putting it on a dinner for kids their own age from Somalia who were refugees who had just been transplanted into Green Bay and learn their stories and talk to them about how they could connect. That turned out to be a pretty cool project. And, and another one, I'll just get, tell you one, one more. Um, there was a, a group that, of, that wanted to talk about child soldiers. And their project that they wanted to propose was uh, to send care packages to American soldiers and thank them that they themselves did not have to be child soldiers. And so I said, well, okay, I, I appreciate that you're wanting to send care packages, that's cool. And I, I see your, your lesson here as an introductory lesson. Your introductory lesson is, I'm sure glad that's not me which is kind of the first reaction people often have when encountering extreme poverty or suffering. It's like, wow, I'm really glad that's not me. Okay, that's an important lesson, but you gotta go way beyond that. And so I said, what, what might you do actually for child soldiers or for former child soldiers or for families who've lost kids or child soldiers who are now 30 years old and trying to reintegrate into communities? What about them? And they didn't know any of those people. I said, well, actually, I know some of those people. And so sitting there with them, I sent emails uh, to a couple of friends in Uganda. And I said, here, here are two people who are working with former child soldiers in northern Uganda. Let's send them a note and see what ideas they might have for you. And you can ask them what might be a good project if you want to do something about child soldiers. And they ended up on Skype with a guy named Victor Ocean who's testifying before the International Criminal Court about Lord's Resistance Army. And he's, he went from there to have a one-on-one -on -one appointment with Desmond Tutu. And he has been one-on-one -on -one with Obama and one-on-one -on -one with Ban Ki-moon. And the guy's 29 years old. Okay, he's a really impressive guy in northern Uganda. And he Skypes with this middle school class from Bayview, Bayview Middle School in Green Bay and talks to them about what they can do to connect with former child soldiers. And what I'm suggesting is that if we work on some creative things together, uh, we can come up with some pretty cool stuff that might actually turn into something. And their project turned into a pen pal project where they're writing kids there and interacting. Um, and just, I'll tell you one more. Um, the first time I went to Rwanda, my, I told my Rwandan friend who was, was taking me there, I said, you know, I, I'm in, I, I, can, I can do anything, truly. I, if you want me to dig ditches, you want me to paint, you want me to teach, you want me to, to do counseling, I mean, whatever you want, I'll do whatever. You know, just keep me busy. I'll do anything. And he shook his head and he said, you stupid Americans. 
He said, you all think that you have to be busy in order to do something good. He said, it might be that you need to learn more about a ministry of presence. And it might be that I sit you down with a 90-year-old lady who can barely talk, and your job for the day is to sit with her. He said, that needs to be okay, too. And I said, yeah, okay. I hear you. And, and so all that to say, connecting with people is step one, and we go from there. Great question. What thank else? You, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and thank you all for oh for oh coming. And we <laughs> hope to see you back here. Um, we're going to take a couple weekends off, but we'll be back on the 21st and the 28th. Uh, in the meantime, we'd encourage you to come back tonight. We have a coffee house concert featuring Matt can, Wall. Can I do one more thing? Oh, sure. It looked like we were just running out of oh, questions okay. there. Yeah. No, I want. I actually wanted to say uh, just a couple more things in close. If we're done, if we're done with questions. Can I just like, like, Absolutely. Can, can you give me like two minutes? Okay. Oh, well, there's a question. Oh, okay. This is a very short question, but you were talking about contacting your representatives in yeah. Congress and that a phone call would work as well as a long letter. Yeah. Certainly a letter would work. What about email? Oh, emails um, apparently are handled differently in different offices, okay. but in general, they're pretty good. Are they yeah, tracked? They're, 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 yeah, they are tracked. They are counted. They are tracked, yep. They so are. for younger people who maybe wouldn't care to write a letter or spend yeah. the time with a phone call, an email would work as well. Yeah, emails are good. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. for that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, so um, this is a placeholder. Um, it's act, uh, that's a picture of the source of the Nile in Uganda. And um, uh, I use it sometimes when I talk about origin of human rights, which I thought somebody might want to talk about and nobody asked about. So I'd, right now it's a placeholder. But the, the gist of it is that the Nile uh, flows out of a lake, flows out of Lake Victoria. And so multiple countries claim to be the source of the Nile because they all have streams in which if you threw a stick in the stream, it would flow into Lake Victoria and would end up in the Nile. And lots of religions and other philosophies believe that they're the source of human rights because you can trace ideas all through them and they end up in the Enlightenment and they end up in the Human Rights Project and they're kind of like this. And I'm all for all those because they all contribute. So that's what that's for. But I want to just offer two things in closing. One is that um, ultimately if we're going to make progress in the area of human rights, we need to adopt what South Africans call Ubuntu. The notion of empathy that says, I am because we are. That, that it's our connection that determines my identity. And I am because we are Ubuntu uh, looks for ever-widening circles of connection. So it's not just you know, my family or my good friends in my neighborhood or my friends at school or my cousins or my country, but what does it look like to include even distant neighbors in that? And to say that unless there is peace and joy and freedom for you, there's no real peace and joy and freedom for me. And what does it look like for me to advocate for your peace and joy and freedom? Um, and then just one last thing, and with this, this is what I wanted to get to in closing, and thinking about why, I, uh, why I'm a hopeful realist. Um, I asked somebody one time who's a human rights scholar why she kept doing it. Why do, you, why do you stay with it? How can you keep advocating for those ideals when there's so much, there's so much working against it? And she pointed me to this. 
in the words of Walter Benjamin. There is a painting by Klee called Angelus Novus, showing an angel looking as if he's about to move away from something he is fixedly contemplating. His eyes are staring, his mouth is open, his wings are spread. And this is how one pictures the angel of history. His face is turned toward the past, where we perceive a chain of events. He sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage and hurling it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay, awaken the dead, and make whole what has been smashed. But a storm is blowing from paradise. It has got caught in his wings with such a force that the angel can no longer close them. The storm propels him irresistibly into the future to which his back is turned, while the pile of debris before him grows skyward. This storm is what we call progress. When I think about human rights progress, I think of that. I've got a little picture of that in my office. And I think of history moving forward while the pile of rubbish grows, while the destruction grows, but the history progresses. And it progresses as if under a wind from paradise. Again, I find hope in your hopefulness. I find hope in the realities of good progress being made. I also find hope in what I believe to be the movement of history. I think it's going in a direction. I think it's going in the right direction. I think it has all kinds of fits and starts. I think it has disasters in between. But I do think there is such a thing as being on the right side of history, and I hope we're on it. That's what I think. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Pine. We appreciate you coming. Thank you all.